Welcome back everyone. We have come to the Railway Museum in York, formerly the National Railway Museum. Uh, they were doing a lot of maintenance when we were last here and updates. Uh, they've now moved the entrance to a more central part, but all the rural carriages are currently closed. We've still got access to all of the trains behind, uh, but we are mainly here to see the Flying Scotsman for its 100th birthday. I don't know if this is new, but we missed this last time. It's off to the little side. There's a button you can press. See all the documents in there? This engine ran over the highest stretch of railway in England. I was in operation for over 50 years, all with a very open cab, keeping the driver and fireman very open to the elements, come rain, wind or snow. This is one of the first electric trains in Britain running on the London and North Western Railway suburban service into London from 1914. This is the largest engine in the museum, and the largest ever built in Britain. It was designed for a specific line in China, which needed it to be large and powerful without putting too much weight on each axle, due to steep hills and weak bridges on the line. So Kenneth Cantley, who designed this train, was actually the godson of the first president of the Chinese Republic. And when the train finished its service in 1981, the Chinese government donated the engine to the museum. This engine was built in Britain and exported to South Africa to be used in the diamond mine trade. After 70 years of work, it was donated to conservationist David Shepherd as a thank you for a helicopter he had donated to Zambia to help prevent poaching. He then brought the engine back to Britain. So this time it's changed since last time, you can go inside the bullet train. Very good disable access to it. I like it. They've got a new section about innovation and going to net zero carbon. And there's a section here is very interesting about sleepers. So instead of being made of wood, now making them out of recycled plastic bottles, which is what this is. They have restored this Pullman to what it was like in the 1920s. steam train in the world, the Mallard, reaching 126 miles an hour. And my second favourite steam engine. My favourite, Fine Scotland, which we will see in about an hour. This carriage was pulled by the Mallard and the Flying Scotsman when they set their records. And it measured the speed they were going, how much fuel they were using, how much water they were using. 
The red and gold colours of the Duchess of Hamilton never appeared in service. They were only ever shown like this at the World's Fair in America. When they're on the main line, they're in blue and silver. But this train was used until 1971 and you've got like no space to stand, it's a little bit on the side and I guess a little bit on the other side just because it's double ended and designed here very, around very tight corners in mountainous areas. Three hundred and ten of these were made, and this is the only surviving one. They got lots of these signs around with QR codes on, and they give you a little audio story about the subject at the top. So here we have women's work on site. This train here was used in the film Chariots of Fire. It's also pulled royalty. It's very impressive. The Evening Star was the largest steam locomotive ever built for British Rail. Painted in green to commemorate the fact that it was more of a special unit, whereas most goods engines back then were painted in black. And also given a name rather than just a number. The Class 20 was the first diesel locomotive to be used on British Rail main lines. It was so successful that there are still some in use today. And it's time to go see the Flying Scotsman! Between 1950 and 1952, the Flying Scotsman was painted blue to be with the British Railway colours. So that was the Flying Scotsman. I am very happy to have seen it. I always want to come and see that. And obviously, when the Paul came, it was out of service, it wasn't here. So, looking up, this time we got tickets. They've got a sign of the longest place name in the world in Wales. They've moved the plate of the gearbox forward, and got a bit of perspex, and you can turn this dial to see the teeth move inside on the gears. In the conservation room we have Henry Oakley, the first 442 locomotive in Britain and the only GNR train to have a name between the years of 1898 and 1922. If you know why it was the only one to have a name, please let me know in the comments, because I'm curious. This model railway was used to train signalmen and is recognised by the Guinness Book of Records as the oldest working model railway in the world. It was built in 1912, but up until 1953 it was voluntary to attend the class that they taught with it, which is absolutely mad. Why would it be voluntary to attend a class on how to be a good signalman? Going to crash your trains! You can come to see the signalling school in operation on certain dates, as you can see in there if you were interested in coming to look at it. We saw railway police helmets last time, fireman hats this time. 
Oh, we've got scavenger hunt things for the kids to do, which is quite cute. We've got a more modern self-service ticket machine. And it goes to West Drayton, where I grew up. A man named James Bill Richard made all of the things in his cabinet. The locomotives, the carriages, the wagons. He has the Guinness World Record for the most handmade trains, locomotive wagons, by a single person. And it just keeps going. Very impressive. And it continues over here. I thought it was that cabinet, it's not, there's these ones as well. And the final cabinet here. And they are slightly larger by one millimetre than normal O gauge, so they don't work on a normal model railway track. The North Shed has so much in it, I don't think you could ever see it all. I've seen stuff that we didn't see when we came last year, and I think it will come again. I still will see new things. But the highlight this year, obviously, was the Flying Scotsman, an absolutely beautiful engine. I'm so glad to finally see it in person, and it's meant to be doing some runs from London to Great Yarmouth later this year, so if I get the chance, I might see if I can see it on the main line as well. The Railway Museum is doing what the Science Museum did, and building a wand lab for the kids, it's meant to be opening this summer, so it's really good to see them moving forward and doing things for the children as well. to fly in Scotsman merchandise because it's 100 years and it's the Flying Scotsman's best birthday ever. I got this 100 years Flying Scotsman pin badge. With one of the pools currently closed that brings us to the end of our trip to the Railway Museum. It's been a very interesting visit. It's been amazing seeing the Flying Scotsman finally after all these years of wanting to see it uh, and actually having come less than a year since the last time we visited seeing the changes. There's a lot more options about to walk up and look inside the engines, uh, or the carriages for some of them. Good. So, this is a visitor announcement. Being interrupted. The museum is starting its closing procedures. With the exception of going into the bullet train, all of the ways up to look into the engines and the carriages does require you to be able to use stairs. Um, but even then, it's still really interesting to be able to go and actually have a look inside these things. Um, something that we weren't able to really do much when we came last year. Obviously the other hall is now closed until they finish refurbishing it. Uh, it will be interesting to see what they actually put in there now. I have no idea what the changes are going to be. Obviously there's one glad they're building for the children to stay over on the side of this hall. Um, and yeah, the section with the Flying Scotsman hasn't really changed, other than the fact that for this visit, it was in there. Which was the highlight of the day, let's be honest. Thank you for joining me today guys, and we'll see you for the next adventure. Bye!